Let's pray this morning. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you in your word. Open our ears to hear the good word that you have spoken to us. Amen. Today marks a new chapter for Grace Church. We are officially in a transition from our full-time pastor, Pastor Perrin, uh, as he and Jody prepare for their new ministry in Japan, and we go about looking for a new pastor. I am sure that this brings some mixed emotions. There is probably some excitement for them and for us because God will do great things, and we don't know where God will take us, and that's a little exciting. It's a little scary. It's a little concerning sometimes. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's probably some worry. And it's all just a little unsettling. When the familiar shifts, when life changes in significant ways, we sometimes find ourselves groping for security and assurance. And our text this morning offers us these things. We are looking at a passage that will be very familiar to some of you, and I know if you've looked at the bulletin, some of you are panicking a little bit about a few things. Um, don't. <laughs> We're looking at a passage that is often used as a benediction in worship services. And a benediction, Pastor Henry reminded me once, means a good benediction word. It is a good word. And that's exactly what this is. It is a good word or a blessing spoken over people. In our case, this is God's good word spoken over us. So let's read it. It's in the book of Numbers. And as, as Rich has already said to me this morning, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon from the book of Numbers. That's all right. I'm sure many of you have heard the passage. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. I am glad to see that you are all still seated and that nobody got up to go out and drink coffee. That the psalm, this uh, prayer is often said at the end of a service, service, just before you gather all your belongings and head out to drink coffee and talk. So thank you for staying put. I appreciate that. The verses that you're familiar with are verses 24 through 26, but they are surrounded by a frame in verses 22 and 23 and verse 27. And it's this frame that gives us the context for what's said here. It helps us understand the context and the purpose of this blessing. It gives us the backstory, and as we'll discover, it gives us a little bit of the front story, we might call it, looking ahead at its significance and purpose. So let's look at that frame first. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, dot, dot, dot. And then after the benediction at the end, we have, so they, meaning the priests, will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So, what is the backstory? What's the context of this blessing? Well, for starters, we are in the book of Numbers. And most of you could probably find the book of Numbers. It's really close to the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, bingo, Numbers. But Numbers is set during the years of wilderness wandering. It's when God's people had been brought, been brought out of Egyptian slavery, and they were on their way to the promised land in Canaan under the leadership of Moses. So they had crossed the Red Sea, and they had gone to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God entered into a covenant with these people that he would be their God, and they would be his people. So our text, this blessing, is set during that time when Israel was still at Sinai and Moses was receiving these instructions. 
about how this covenant people could live in relationship with God and with each other as a community. And this blessing comes at the very end of those instructions. So the Lord gives Moses instructions to pass on to Aaron and his sons. You all know who Moses is, but who is Aaron and who are his sons? Anybody know? Aaron, very good. Aaron is the brother of Moses, yes. And he and his sons were the priestly family in Israel. That is, they were the appointed members, the appointed mediators between God and his people, between the worshiping community and God. They had charge of the tabernacle and the temple and eventually the temple and sacrifices that were made when the people came to meet with God. So God tells Moses to instruct Aaron and his sons in what to say. And I'm going to pause here and laugh because I, I snickered at Kathy putting this in the bulletin and trying to deal with all the quotation marks in this text. Um, just for a snicker, take a look at the text in the bulletin, and it is a nightmare of quotation marks. Because God said to Moses, say to Aaron to tell the people. It's a nightmare. So kudos to Kathy for trying to tackle that mess. So this, God is telling Moses to instruct Aaron in what they should say to bless the Israelites. And this act of blessing by the priests in the Lord's name was really one of the chief duties of the priests. They offered sacrifices and all the other things associated with the tabernacle, but it was one of their chief duties to bless the people in the name of the Lord. It's mentioned in several other places. Sometimes these blessings were said when the people came into the tabernacle, um, but it was more common to say them when the people left. A benediction, like this particular one. So, Aaron and his sons are to speak this blessing over the people. But let's think for a minute about who these people are. This is the community of God's people. With God's presence smack dab in the center of their camp. They are literally surrounding the presence of God. And they come to the tabernacle to offer their sacrifices for forgiveness of sins, for gratitude and thanks, for restored fellowship with God. And then when they're right with God, they leave the tabernacle, the presence of God for them, and they return to their neighbors and their crops and their responsibilities. But as they go, the priests send them out with this blessing from their God. This blessing was repeated day after day, week after week, year after year, after generation after generation. But in order for those Old Testament Israelites to fully experience this blessing, they had to remain faithful to God, which we know they didn't. So instead of the blessing of being in covenant with God, they actually received the consequences of disobedience and unfaithfulness. All right, so that's all the backstory for the blessing. Now let's actually look at what it says. May the Lord bless you. What does it mean for God to bless people? We use the word a lot. We throw it around a lot. We hear of uh, God's blessing is actually a major theme in the scripture. And we hear it in the very first chapter of the Bible when God blesses his creation. Um, for our purposes this morning, we're going to limit this discussion and say that when God blesses people, he is empowering and endowing them to live life as he intended, as he created it to be lived. And that's the, o the only way that kind of life can be lived is when his image bearers are in right relationship with him as creator and savior. Blessings for covenant faithfulness in the Old Testament were both tangible and intangible. Good crops, children, and lots of them, long life, prosperity, safety. So this request, may God bless you, may the Lord bless you, is a request that the Lord provide everything the people needed to flourish and thrive. And in some ways, the request that the Lord bless them summarizes everything else that follows here. And what does follow? May the Lord bless you and keep you. Keep you from what? Some translations will say, may the Lord protect you. Protect you from what? 
Well, the best answer is anything you need protecting from. God is the only one who can protect you. Your bank account, your medical record, your retirement plan, they can't protect you. Your friends and family, your government, your neighbors, they can't protect you. We think, we deceive ourselves, we think they can. But only God, sometimes using those things, can protect us. Perhaps the best reflection on how God keeps us or how God protects us comes from Psalm 121, where the word keep or watch over shows up six times in eight verses. Um, This is another familiar passage for some of you. Let me read it. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. May the Lord bless you and keep you. That is, may the Lord give you everything that you need to thrive and flourish, and may he watch over and protect you from seen and unseen danger. Then the next line of the blessing says, May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. This request that the Lord make his face shine on you is the first of two requests that involve God's face. The the next one's in the second line, or the next line. May the Lord lift up or turn his face towards you. Um, This is obviously figurative language. God doesn't have a face. He's a spirit. But the idiom here, that God make his face shine, is a request that he be pleased with the people. Think of a bright smile. Everybody smile at me bright smile. Shine your face at me. Beam at me, if you will. Maybe you don't want to beam at me, but you, there are people in your life you probably beam at, and you would do anything for them. You delight in them. May the Lord delight in us. May he have such pleasure in us that he is prompted to act on our behalf, especially when we're in danger. Listen to the prayers of some psalmists who echo this same request that the Lord make his face shine on the people. In Psalm 31, let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. And then Psalm 80, it shows up three times. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but three times we have, restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. And one more time, in case you missed it. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. This is a request that God smile on his people, beam at them, and act accordingly on their behalf. They don't deserve it. So the blessing continues with a follow-up request that makes perfect sense. And be gracious to us. Grace is an attitude of favor from a superior to an inferior. It's not deserved. And God, of course, is far superior to anyone and anything. But nonetheless, he is quick to extend grace. It is his character to be gracious, and especially to his covenant people. From Exodus 34 comes this really familiar and beloved description of God. The Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. So this blessing in Numbers says, may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. That is, may the Lord delight in you and so deal with you every day out of his great mercy and grace. May he forgive your sins. May he deliver you from all affliction. Then the last line of the blessing says, May the Lord lift up or turn his face to you and give you peace. 
The second idiom about God's face is a request that God pay attention to people, pay attention to his people. As I stand up here this morning, I can see that most of you are paying attention to me. You've lifted your faces toward me. But we're set up for that, right? And more or less, that's kind of why you came to listen to whatever's going on up here. But this idiom that the Lord lift his face is not just about listening to someone when they talk to you. It's about noticing them, seeing their needs, and then doing something about it. Um, We might think of the story of the Good Samaritan, the man on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets beat up, mugged, left for dead on the side of the road, and two people come by, and they see him, and they keep going. It's not until the Samaritan comes that somebody actually sees him and attends to his needs. It was the Samaritan who took note of him. We might say he lifted his face to the man. May the Lord lift his face to you. That is, may he see, really see you, and hear, really hear you. May he tend to your needs and show you his favor and bless you with all good things, including, and even culminating in, in this blessing, peace. The Hebrew word peace, which is shalom, is more than the absence of conflict. It is the sum total of God's good gifts, well-being, health, prosperity, salvation. It is an environment with all the right conditions for everyone to flourish and thrive. In fact, we could think about this entire benediction in terms of the first request and the last one. May the Lord bless you and give you peace. Everything in between is all part of that package. The Lord's watch care over you, his delight in you, his gracious forgiveness of your many sins, his gracious help in your weaknesses, his attentive care. All of these are God's blessing. And together, they result in peace. These are really wonderful words, aren't they? But there's more. This blessing is a poem. And what that means in any language is that it's trying to capture more than just words. It's trying to do more than just report an event or list instructions for you. Poetry tries to pull you in to an emotion or to recreate an experience for you, the reader. Or in the case of Hebrew poetry, for the listener. Since very few people in the Bible's original audience had their own copies of the Bible. They heard the scriptures when they were read or when they were recited or when they were taught. Most people did not read them. Now... This makes Hebrew poetry tricky for us on several levels. First, most of you don't know Hebrew, right? Second, we're not, a, we're not accustomed to listening. We, we read, typically. Well, happily for us this morning, these obstacles are not entirely insurmountable. I think, I think we can still get a little bit of the sense of what emotion and experience this poem, this blessing, is trying to capture. To do that, we're going to look at the poem in Hebrew, but don't panic. We're going to start easy, okay? Um, So if if Thomas back there would give us the NIV slide there, I think we have. Oh, not that one. Can we just have that? No, that one. That's the one we want. Nope. That one. Thank you. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now, you don't have to know a lick of Hebrew to make some important observations here. Ooh, bring that back, please. Thank you. Keep it there. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to tell them what I actually wanted this morning, so they're doing a fine job back there. <laughs> All right, so important observations. Who is the agent of blessing? The Lord.
be there once. In fact, it's, it's actually left out like here. This could be, may the Lord give you peace. May he give you peace. These are all sentences. And our Hebrew poet here, decide, well, this is from the Lord, decided to keep the Lord's name in there three times. So you don't miss the point. It's abundantly clear that the Lord is the source of this blessing. Now, Aaron and his sons may be speaking it, and it came from Moses, from the Lord, but this blessing is from the Lord. Every ounce of it. In and through whatever means he chooses. The blessing comes from the Lord. A second thing that's easy to see, and you can keep this up here, a second thing that's easy to see is the recipient of these blessings. Who's the recipient? You. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Six times. You. Those are actually singular yous. You. And you. And you. And you. And you. And you. It's not y'all. show you some Hebrew. Don't panic. So you can actually see something, but don't, go, don't do it yet, Thomas. Hang on one second. I want you to see something that you can't see in English. So take a really good look at this. Squint if you have to. You good? Yeah. All right, Thomas, go for it. Give us the Hebrew. All right. So Hebrew starts over here. Goes this way. So verse 24, verse 25, verse 26. You don't have to read a thing. Just look at it. Is anyone brave enough to tell me something you know? Squint. Anything you see about this poem. This is verse 24. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Verse 25. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Verse 26. May the Lord lift his face to you and give you peace. But you see. It has characters. Line, get long. You don't have to know what it says. I told you what it says. This line only goes to here. This line goes all the way to here, and this one goes all the way down here. I'm going to make sure I don't go down there. You can see that. You can see what if you were a Hebrew listener, you would hear. You would hear each line of this blessing get longer and longer. It's as if this blessing starts as a trickle and it picks up speed until it overflows. And it culminates and overflows in peace. This blessing from the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, is for you, 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 you. May the Lord bless you, the people of God living in right relationship with him. May he bless you more and more and more, giving you peace. Thanks, Thomas. This isn't the end, though. Uh, it's the end of the blessing, but it's not the end of the text. We still have verse 27. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. So this blessing closes with a frame that matches the opening one. The Lord had instructed Moses to have Aaron bless the people with these words, and now he says, so they, meaning the priests, will put my name on the Israelites, and I myself will bless them. Um, that myself usually gets left out of translations, but it is really there. It's an emphatic. I myself will bless them. Who's this blessing from? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, you cannot miss that. This statement about the Lord putting the Lord's name on people is the only place such a thing is said in the Old Testament. One commentator suggests it should have been perhaps meant to be taken literally. Uh, some of you may have seen pictures where 
Jewish people have a little box on their head or on their wrist called a phylactery, and in those they keep some texts, some verses that they want to remember. So possibly, but I think something else is going on here. I lost my place. <laughs> place that the Lord is said to put his name on people. But there are numerous places in the Old Testament where the Lord puts his name somewhere. He chooses a city, Jerusalem, and in that city they build a temple, and the Lord puts his name in those places. And so the people came to the temple to meet with the Lord, where his name was, and they worshiped there in his presence. And when they were done at the temple, they left, they went back home. And as they went, the priests sent them out with this blessing from their God. And God says, by doing this, you are putting my name on them. They went home bearing Yahweh, their covenant God, the Lord's name. That meant they were his. They belonged to him. Like children belong to their parents, or like spouses belong to each other. For most of my life, I bore my parents' name, Witter. It still shows up several places. But, And I, I was proud of that name. I tried to honor them by the things that I did. When I got married, I took Rick's name. And everywhere I go, I bear his name. I belong to him, not as property or some kind of asset, but as his beloved wife. Right, honey? <laughs> <laughs> and belonging to him shapes the way I live. It affects the choices I make. So too for God's people bearing his name. They went out bearing the good name of their God, who was ready and willing to pour oceans of blessing into their lives. And by speaking these words of blessing, of benediction on them, the priest created a bridge from the place of worship, the sacred space in God's presence, to their lives outside, where they ate and argued, where they labored and loved, where they lived and died. They took God's name and his blessing with them. The words of blessing spoken by the priests conferred on the people the confidence and the hope that their God, whose name they bore, would take care of every part of their lives. Well, that's all well and good, but you aren't Old Testament Israelites, and I'm not Aaron or his son or daughter. So what does this blessing, tucked away back in the book of Numbers, have to do with you? Well, first of all, this blessing may have been spoken over ancient Israelites, but it was never intended to stop with them. God's blessing of his covenant people from the very first man he chose, Abraham, was always aimed outward. Abraham was blessed so that he and his descendants could be a blessing to the world. With respect to this priestly blessing, this truth really comes through in Psalm 67, where the psalmist takes these words from, from Numbers 6, and he works them into his song. Listen to what he says. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples we mean peoples other than the Jews, praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth this prayer for God's blessing in number six, number six was never meant to be a dead-end street or something hoarded by God's people. God's blessing on his people was to be a 
channel for his revelation, his salvation, and his blessing for all nations and all people. And we, my friends, are the recipients of that blessing on those covenant people. Through them, he sent into the world the fullness of peace, the embodiment of peace, the one who made peace for us. And in that Prince of Peace, God invites us into a new covenant with him. He invites us into his family, and he joins us into the community of those who love him. And like the Old Testament Israelite people of God, we are called to bless the world around us, to bear well the name of the God who redeemed us from sin, who delights in us as his children. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The spirit of Christ indwells us, and we live in anticipation of full and abundant life forever in the presence of the one from whom all blessings flow. Pray with me. Oh, good and gracious God, you are more than we can imagine and more than we could ever have hoped for. Your blessings know no end, and we humbly receive them. May we bear your name well. May we embrace the fullness of life you give in Christ. May we eagerly, earnestly, and gratefully offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, day 